near you, if you wouldn't mind turning to Judges chapter 4, that would be great. If you're uh, in the church, uh, you should uh, find that uh, pew uh, Bible just at the end of the pew. If you're at home, uh, you'll find it just on the shelf uh, in your dining room. Uh, It's the third book from the left. Yes, I have been spying on you. So, uh, Judges chapter 4, this marvellous a uh, marvellous story. Now, I've got a few um, different tools here of, of different sorts. Um, what's that for? Can anyone enlighten me? What do you use that for? Straining vegetables, fishing out, fishing out dumplings. Brilliant. Um, great. Yeah, so uh, there's a little kitchen tool. Um, what about that one? What would you use that for? Scraping off wallpaper, yeah, I think so. Uh, this one, a little bit similar. What would you use that for? Tom enlightened me before. But driving a wedge b- between things and bashing things up, basically. I wasn't quite sure about that one. Uh, what, what about this one? What, what would you use that for? Pretty easy. Uh, <laughs> Joe's got the right idea. She's following your ale, yeah. Um, So uh, your ale found an interesting use for that. You can just use it for uh, knocking tent pegs into the ground or banging in nails. Uh, But your ale had a different uh, use, as you may remember from the story. What about us? What are we useful for if uh, we are meant to be tools uh, for God to use? What are we useful for? How can we be useful to God? How can we serve him and keep serving him. I don't know whether you are um, serving in any sort of formal way as a Christian and, uh, and whether there are things that uh, you've committed to do to serve God because of a Christian faith this morning. don't know how that's going for you. Well, this story that we're looking for uh, has got three uh, main characters in it and, uh, and we can learn a bit about how we can serve the Lord through it. So if you've got that open, in front of you. Verses uh, 1 to 10 introduces to the first character. I'm just going to dig in my bag here and pull out this little aid memoir, this uh, little reminder. Um, this is a very, very small tree. I think the tree she was sitting under was, uh, was much bigger. Um, but the first character we meet is a woman sitting under a tree. Uh, You'll have a look at uh, verses 4 to 5. It says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. And so she was regularly under this tree. People knew where to find her, and they could go to her and get a, a judgment. You know, two people who are disagreeing, or somebody wanted to know how they could serve the Lord, follow her, they'd go and see Deborah. And at this time, you can see in verses 1 to 3, that the usual cycle was going on in the life of Israel. You may remember this from a couple of weeks ago. Remember what this is? It's a dangerous cycle. And that's what... The, uh, the people in the time of Judges were in a dangerous cycle. Look at verses 1 to 3. They did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. And then the people of Israel, verse 3, cried out to the Lord. Evil judgment. They cry out to the Lord. And then the next part of the cycle is that he saves them. Now, Actually, God was already at work by putting Deborah under this tree as the prophetess who would give judgment and uh, lead the people of Israel at that time. But there was a great answer to prayer then that came through her. Verses 6 to 7. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you... Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you at the river Kishon with his chariots and troops, and I will give him into your hand. Now, we always need promises 
certainty about the future, don't we, in order to move forward in any way. Just a, a week or two ago, we had uh, a couple uh, from Norwich University of the Arts uh, in our Christian Union who got married here, and uh, it was a really lovely occasion. But um, you can imagine how important those promises were that they gave to each other in order to move forward. And you can imagine how outrageous it would be if, um, if they had just been to visit church without making those promises and then they'd, they'd gone back and, uh, and uh, he'd, he'd said, oh, can you just give me your um, bank account details because I want to share your bank account now. If they hadn't made those promises, what, what do you mean? You, you can't tuck into my bank account. It's my bank account. Um, hey, uh, by the way, I'm going to live here from now on. I'm going to share. Well, no, you can't possibly do that. It's only uh, when you have those promises that you can be sure uh, that, uh, that you can move forward together. Now, we have, as Christians, the great promises of Jesus. You may remember, after his resurrection, before he ascended to heaven, uh, he uh, stood there before his disciples and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, and surely I am with you. So we've been given a command to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching everything that Jesus has commanded us. And we have his promise that he has authority over all nations and that he will be with us in whatever we do. And that's what gives us confidence in our service, is Jesus' promise that he is the Lord, he's the king of the world, he's in charge of everything, and that he is with us. That's what gives us confidence as we go to serve. Then let's move on and have a look at the second character. The second character uh, we meet here was a man with a sword. Now, if you have a look at verse, uh, uh, verse 7, uh, we find uh, that uh, uh, 6 and 7, that uh, Deborah is calling Barak uh, to go and attack Sisera with all his troops. And Barak says to her, I will go if you will go with me. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Now, you can understand why Barak was scared. After all, we've already seen from verse 3 that their enemies had 900 iron chariots. Now, at that time, the Israelites had conquered most of the territory of uh, Israel, the, the land, the promised land, but actually they, they were mainly concentrated in the hills because down on the plain, down in the valleys, their enemies had iron chariots. And basically the people of Israel were still in the Bronze Age while their enemies had already entered the Iron Age and they had the latest technology, the equivalent of having Challenger tanks down there in the plains. And they were okay up in the hills, but down there in the plains, it felt a little bit scary facing this terrible army. We can understand why Barak would be scared and uh, uncertain about whether to go or not. And more than that, Deborah had said to go to Mount Tabor. Now, Mount Tabor is about 1,300 feet high, and it stands out in the middle of the plain. Now, what, uh, what Barak would have known is that going and gathering all his troops, 10,000 people, on this mountain could mean that he'd be surrounded by these chariots and be trapped on the mountain. Militarily, it didn't sound like a very good idea. Well, verse 12, we find that Sisera was told Barak had gone up to Mount Tabor and he thought, great, let's get the chariots out, folks. Let's go and we'll surround them and we'll capture them. But Deborah, verse 14, said to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? And in verse 15, we find the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And then Sisera ran away and Barak pursued the chariot. Now we find out a little bit more about how the Lord gave them this victory in chapter 5 and verse 21. They went to uh, Mount Tabor by the river Kishon. Verse 21 of chapter 5 says, 
as they're celebrating the victory, the torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. Now, the river Kishon is uh, one of these typical um, uh, wadis uh, from the Middle East, which in summer and the dry season would just turn into a, a little trickle, a brook at the bottom of a deep valley. But when it came to the rainy season or when heavy rains came, suddenly the rains would come pouring down off all the surrounding mountains, all into the river Kishon, and it would turn suddenly into a great torrent, as it's described here. And that's what seems to have happened. And suddenly, all these chariots were all stuck in the mud, and suddenly they're, they're in a terrible, muddy chariot traffic jam, trying to escape in, in what's a, a narrow sort of funnel of land. And so it might sound incredible, the idea that the whole army could be wiped out, but they were like sitting ducks, stuck in their, in their chariots, beeping their horns, and, uh, and saying, get a move on up there, but everyone was stuck in the mud, sitting ducks. Now, the letters of the Hebrews in the New Testament tells us that Barak was a great man of faith, and he was. He went out and faced this terrible army. But his faith also was limited, and there was a consequence to that. Look, look at verse 9. Deborah says to him, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. He would miss out on the glory of the victory because his faith was great, but not as great as God's promise. Now, I wonder how many of us this morning have heard of the very important figure of Ronald Wayne. You know? Now, Ronald Wayne uh, actually is one of these uh, figures in history that did actually have an impact. Um, he was uh, one of three founders of a company. But after a few weeks, he sold his 10% stake in the company. I think he, he got a few hundred dollars for it, about $800. Unfortunately for him, the company was Apple. And if he'd hung in there with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, his stake would be worth, I think it's about $200 billion now. Uh, but he got about 800 for it. Uh, because he didn't have that confidence that the company would really succeed and would really go places. And, and of course, had he been able to look into the future and see what would happen with Apple, he would have done anything to keep that stake. He'd have sold the shirt off his back, he'd have worked nights and days, it wouldn't matter, as long as he could keep that stake. Now, when we're serving, uh, sometimes that can be costly, uh, it can be uh, sometimes fearful, we can worry, are we going to be exhausted, are we going to look stupid in front of others, are we going to do it badly, make a big mess of it. But we can trust that we have a God who is with us, we have a saviour who is Lord of the world, who is with us and he goes with us as we go to serve him. But look, there's one more character here, isn't there? And uh, she is uh, the woman with the tent peg. This is a little peg uh, from our tent back home. Sisera fled, verse 17, and he went to uh, the tent of Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenites. They were a people who were linked with Israel, but had kind of fallen out with Israel for a little while, and so he thought that he was safe there. Yael uh, welcomed him. Turn aside, my lord, verse 18, uh, she covered him with a rug, he asked for water, he gave her milk, even better. And then, verse 21, uh, he fell asleep, Yael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hands. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. And so he died. 
gosh, it doesn't sound very nice, does it? It's um, not really, you know, this isn't a verse that you should read when you're camping. It might make you feel a bit nervous. We had uh, Amanda come and visit us in our tent when we were on holiday recently, and I hope that she felt at ease and didn't feel like she had to keep her eye on the mallets and make sure that all the, all the tent pegs uh, stayed away. It's not a, a verse that we take for ourselves. Yes, this is what I need to do unless we're facing a cruel dictator. But have a look over the page at chapter 5, verse 24. Most blessed of women be Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. And why was she so blessed? Because unlike Barak, she trusted the Lord fully. We don't really know what kind of background she came from. But at the end of the day, she believed that the Lord was the victor. And she wanted to be on the winning side. And she acted and, uh, and took, uh, took his side. Now, I wonder if I can have uh, my little prop down here. Barney, Barney, good boy. Come here, come here, come on. No, that's all right. No, he's, he's not really a member of the congregation, so he hasn't been baptized yet. Um, I do actually know of a vicar who baptized a cat, but perhaps that's a story for another day. Now, this is, uh, this is Rufty. Uh, sorry, this isn't rough. To, this is Barney. We've got, we've got a friend's dog that we've looked after for years. It looks exactly like him. It's called Rufty. Um, but Barney is, uh, is quite a good dog some of the time. At least he tries. Good boy, sit. Good boy. Okay. Now, I'm going to try and do something. I've, I've never tried this with him before. Okay. So it could fail completely, but we'll have to see. Okay, Barney, Barney, lie down. Lie down, lie down, uh, sit, sit, lie down, lie down, there we go, okay, there we go, I've taught Barney to lie down, isn't that good? Let's try it again, Barney, lie down, lie down, lie down, good boy, good boy. Now, if I spent a little bit longer, I've never tried to teach him to lie down before, um, but um, perhaps we'll, we'll take him back. Now, he'll go where the treats go. Thanks. Now, that is the thing, you see. He will go where the treats go, and he will sort of do what I'm wanting him to do because he feels confident that I am the one with the treats. Now, if I had no treats and I just stood there saying, lie down, Barney, lie down, he wouldn't do it, I'm sure. Now, Yael was confident about where the victory was, where the blessing was. And so, she took action and she served the Lord. Now, there is, of course, actually, cheekily, there's a fourth character in this story, isn't there? Uh, we've had uh, the woman with the tent peg. Here's the man on the cross. He trusted fully in God's promise. He served wholeheartedly to the full extent of his ability. And unlike uh, Barak, now all the glory is his because he trusted and he gave himself in service. Now there's a... Uh, uh, a man who's uh, uh, well known as a Christian minist uh, missionary who you perhaps have heard of called Jim Elliott. 1956, he was um, working to share the gospel with an Ecuadorian tribe who hadn't had much contact in the past with the West. And he, uh, they set up camp nearby and they were um, busy making contact and giving gifts uh, to people in this tribe and, and so on. Um, and sadly, Jim Elliot um, ended up being killed with his uh, co-missionaries by the tribe he was trying to reach. His wife afterwards has gone on working with the tribe, and, uh, and many have come to Christ. But just before they set off on this uh, mission uh, that they were engaged in, 
uh, they sang uh, that famous hymn, We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Thine is the battle, thine shall be the praise. When passing through the gates of pearly splendor, victors, we rest with thee through endless days. He was facing a, a terrible danger and laying himself out for service, but trusting wholly that whatever happened, he would be victorious with Christ. Now let me say this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian this morning, then consider, are you really on the right side? Who is the victor? Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He is Lord of all. He is the victor. And all blessing is his. All glory is his to share with those who trust and serve him. If you're not a Christian this morning, you're taking up the position of Sisera, opposite, opposing God. But in the end, you will not share the blessing of God. And perhaps this morning, uh, you're a Christian, um, maybe you're not serving very much at all. How are you serving? How are you offering yourself to be used by God uh, in, in the home, uh, in the workplace or at school, uni, uh, here in church? How are you serving the Lord? How are you offering yourself to please him? What gifts do you have that you could use to serve the Lord. I'll pray about that today if you're not serving. And perhaps if you are a Christian uh, who is busy serving, well, you might be getting tired of it. You might be feeling a bit worn down by it. But Lord, it's hard going. It's tough keeping on going. Is it really worth it? Yes, it is. Because Jesus Christ is the victor. And if we're confident that he is the victor, we can be sure, no matter what the cost, we will be more than repaid. No matter how fearful it is, how badly we think we might do it, we can be confident that the Lord Jesus Christ is the victor and we will share his glory to the extent that we give ourselves to serve him. So we're going to listen to a song now. My hope is built on nothing less. And you might just want to think about what the Lord's saying to you through this chapter. Um, do you find yourself uh, a bit more like Barak, uh, holding back a bit in your service? Uh, or are you willing to offer yourself as Yael did, trusting that Jesus is the victor, victor, that he will win and that all glory belongs to him? And if you're standing solely on Jesus Christ, that enables you to offer yourself wholly for Jesus Christ. Let's just pray before we listen to the song. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is the one Lord, Saviour, Victor over the world. All glory belongs to him, the one that you sent into our world and who laid down his life for us. Lord, we pray that none of us might be found on the wrong side and opposing him. And more than that, Lord, we pray that we would give ourselves wholeheartedly to serve him as we trust in him, knowing that all glory and blessing is in his hands. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>